Welcome to Libby's Leadership Lab. I'm Libby Gill, and I'm here to help you level up your leadership skills so you can create the professional life you really want without sacrificing your personal life. I've been guiding women executives and entrepreneurs for more than 30 years. First, as a C-suite corporate exec, heading communications at three major Hollywood studios, and now as a business owner and leadership coach. So let's get started. It's time to invent your future. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Leadership Lab. Now, wouldn't it be nice if you could peek into the future, sort of see around those corners and understand what the world of work is going to look like in the year or years ahead? I mean, think about what an advantage that would give you to understand your place in the, in the work world. But we don't have a crystal ball, but we do have my guest today, who is Jeff Wald, who wrote a fascinating book called The End of Jobs, The Rise of On-Demand Workers in Agile Corporations. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me, Libby. Well, listen, right off the top, the end of jobs can sound a little daunting. It so does. Tell everybody what you mean by that. Well, what I mean is that when you're an author, you've got to have a catchy title. You've got to get something <laughs> that grabs people's attention. That is and I will tell you, uh, my last startup was bought by ADP and uh, the world's largest HCM company. And yeah. ADP bought thousands and thousands of copies of the book, um, which was wonderful. Uh, yeah. And then when the book finally was coming out in June of this year, you know, we were in the midst of the biggest economic collapse we've seen, that biggest quarterly GDP decline. And there were, you know, nearly 30 million Americans whose jobs had ended. And ADP felt that uh, they didn't really want to send the books out to their clients because it was insensitive from a title standpoint. And you know what? I get it. I totally get it. And I felt a lot of shame a little bit that I chose this title. I mean, I, I didn't mean it that way, but the book came out as 30 million people didn't have a job. And that felt terrible. It was the end so, of jobs. It was the end of jobs for a lot of people. And quite frankly, still is. We've had a huge economic rebound, yeah. although we'll see how this pandemic continues to play out. But there are still 10 million people that are unemployed in a long-term unemployment construct right now, which used to say there are about 15 million people because there were about five before. Right. And that's a problem. But all of that is, a, is to say that the book's title is meant to be provocative. But I do not think that robots and AI are taking our jobs. It was meant to say that this one office, one manager, nine to five job, that job is over. It's the end of that job specifically. And even pre-pandemic, we were seeing that with re remote teams and globalization and all of the things that were changing in the workplace. So I didn't really take it. I mean, it, it definitely grabs you that end of jobs. But you're, you're also talking about what it's going to look like and how, and you even say that it's not displacing people. And I've seen that, that the, with the automation and the AI will actually create jobs, but different kinds of jobs. You're a hundred percent correct. Look, let me, this is why I wrote the book is that there are a lot of people that make predictions about the future of work outside of the grounding of the history of work outside the grounding of the data available in the world of work and outside of the grounding of how companies actually engage workers. And so it becomes very frustrating for those of us that are operating and building companies to change the world of work to hear predictions that we know are asinine. Can I, can I, is that too strong? You can a language say asinine. Yeah, I can say right. asinine. Okay. It, they're just, they're not intelligent. They're not thoughtful and they have a very low probability of being true. I wouldn't say they have no chance of being true. Strange things happen, but that was a source of frustration for me as a technologist, as someone building uh, a company that was changing the way the world worked, is that there were too many predictions out there that weren't based in history, that weren't based in data, that weren't based in how companies really engage workers. And what that's was what the I biggest to do. thing? What, what really got you when you're looking at, at, at oh. all the inaccuracies and misconceptions? I will tell you something that happened just the other day. Okay. I was on a panel. And a expert, I'm going to air quote the heck out of that guy, said, um, oh, well, I think 50% of the U.S. workforce is going to work remote post-COVID. And I just was like, oh, and I said, okay, um, how do you juxtapose that with the fact that only 42% of U.S. workers can work remotely? Right. 
And he said, oh, oh, I wasn't aware of that. And I said, well, you really should be if you're going to make predictions. And I don't think that they're going to invite me back to that. Well, maybe not. Grouping. But I was incensed for someone to stand on a stage and make a prediction to people that are trying to figure out how to shape the future of work at their companies, to people that are trying to figure out how this world of work impacts them and their families, to hear somebody that's an expert make that kind of prediction, it's inappropriate on so many levels. Plus, you know, because he said an even 50% that it had to be bogus. It's Otherwise, he would have said 53 or 47. You know that the is truth. I, yeah, odd number. You're 100% right. <laughs> you're 100% right. Well, the, yeah, that or would drive me 99.8% percent right, I should exactly. say. Exactly. 99.8% okay. right. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. How do people plan ahead? How do they think about their kids' futures if we don't have some idea of what's really happening out there? So, assuming and, that was your premise, what did you go out in search of and what did you find? Well, I'll tell you this, it took seven years to write the book. And uh, part of that is because, you know, I'm, I'm not a full-time author. I was building a company and we were fortunate enough to sell it again to ADP. And that gave me the space to really finish the book. What I searched for was what has history taught us mm -hmm. as huge technological change has come into the workforce? How do companies, workers, and societies react? Because we're in the early innings of what a lot of people are calling the fourth industrial revolution with robots and AI. Well, what do the first three industrial revolutions teach us? Because we know history tends to rhyme. Yeah. And then the second thing I looked for was data, just every bit of data that I could find. I like building spreadsheets. It's sadly what I do with my free time. I know it's pathetic. Um, and I love data and I want to understand the data patterns and trends because Right. Data doesn't just move like this and then all of a sudden go like that, right? It moves in a very methodical way. And when it does move like that, there is usually a massive, massive reason why. Right. And so I wanted to understand that. And then lastly is I had conversations with hundreds of CHROs, hundreds of other people that are labor leaders, that mm -hmm. are union leaders, that are legislators, that are professors, that are all thinking about the future of work. And I was lucky enough to get 20 of them to uh, contribute to the book nice. and to take out their crystal balls and tell yeah. us what the world looks like in 2040 in their view. Okay, so I'm not even going to go to 2040. How about 2021, 22, 23? I mean, what are the big takeaways for just regular working people? What do we need to know and be prepared to do, whether that's skills or mindset or I would say mindset is probably the most important thing, uh, and that is that these changes are coming and they're coming rapidly. Yeah. And to not be prepared and to not have this construct of an overused term, but it really can't be overused enough, which is lifelong learner. Yeah. The data would tell us that the length of time where a skill abates, where a skill is no longer monetizable, is now four to six years, depending on the skill. And that is to say that every four to six years, if you haven't completely refreshed your skill set, you are in danger of not being able to monetize those skills in a job. And that's just, that is new. That is not yeah. the case. It used to be from you know 18 to 24, you'd go and do the majority of your occupational education, whether at a technical school and on the job training or college. And then those skills were monetizable over your life. Over your career, right. And now we have massively compressed that and that has huge implications for all kinds of workers uh, in all kinds of industries. So my expert quote from where I see, sit maybe, maybe is accurate because I've always said, lifelong learners are the rock stars of the corporate world. If you can't move fluidly through an organization and train and retrain, you're just no longer relevant. And when I started in corporate entertainment, not the most forward thinking business in the world in terms of employees and employee experience, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. You, once you did something well, that was it. You were locked in for life. But if they had known what many other companies even at that time knew was, oh, you're good at this? Well, let's see if you're also good at this or let's transfer right. or train you over here. There was no, I'd probably still be there if I had been able to flow through different disciplines, but there was no way I was gonna stick doing one thing forever. And that is the reality for a lot of people in a corporate environment now is that you have to constantly be ready to be moved. It is not, you're gonna be on one track. It is not that you are gonna have one manager. 
It is not that you're going to be in one office. We, we talk about the death of this job that we have now, which I call the one office, one manager, nine to five job. Yeah. It is moving to what we're calling the fluid team-based work from anywhere, always on job. Yeah. That's the job that everyone needs to understand. And fluid means changing labor classifications. It means changing office structures. Team-based means you don't have just one boss. You're working on a series of different teams that are going to move at different paces and have different constituencies. And so there is a very, very real evolution in the world of work. And COVID has very, very much sped up that part of the future of work. Right. So what is it that people can go into? Mindset, yes, but are there, are there are different skills or what do we need to know to be ready for that? Even knowing we're going to change and evolve as we're in the workplace throughout our careers. So broadly, I have said to people to go hard, go either hard human or hard tech. Hard tech might be easy enough to understand. You know, their job, tremendous job growth, and there will be for really decades to come yeah. in software, in data, in robotics, in AI, in cybersecurity, and a host of things that are hard tech jobs. Those jobs show tremendous growth and tremendous uh, expansion of what people are being paid in those jobs. Yeah. The other side is the hard human. The things that robots, AI systems have no chances of doing any time in the next 20 years. And I will tell you this as someone that has been to the advanced robotics labs and gotten a chance to play with the different technologies that are out there. They're amazing and they're mind blowing, but the idea that you're gonna have Rosie Jetson in your home anytime soon is <laughs> laughable. Oh, like God. it is beyond laughable, it is not happening. I wish it would happen, but it is not happening. And so the hard human are jobs that involve empathy, jobs that involve creativity and design, customer service jobs, jobs that are very much at the forefront of the interaction with another human. Yes. And those might be things in healthcare and they might be again in customer service or marketing or sales. Those jobs are also predicted to grow and they are what I would refer to as hard human jobs. Interesting. I would assume that that includes things like consulting and coaching and any kind of Absolutely. people training, teaching skills. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so when you were on the job, and it sounds like you've been through many iterations, and I read that your first job, I think, your first company, uh, how did you put that? It fell flat on its face, or am I, is that too harsh? Something like that that you said. It would be very accurate in terms of what happened. Uh, look, you know, startup land, when people go and they start their own companies, everyone thinks, oh, I'm going to be Elon Musk, and I'm going to be Mark Zuckerberg. And, yeah. and they don't say to you when you start your company that, not only is failure an option in startup land, it is the most likely outcome. Yeah. Nobody, nobody really tells you that. Everyone kind of looks at the 0.001% cases and say, oh, I want that. Yeah, Statistically, no you're not, you're not going to get that. Like, right. It's not going to happen. So the first one, I made the mistake of funding with my own money. And after a year and a half, it failed. And it basically bankrupted me. And you know, look, it's wonderful that I had the social support network to get the call from my mom to say, do you, do you need to move back home? It doesn't make it any less horrifying when yeah. you get that phone call at 32 to say, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is what my life has become. But you know what? It is what it is. You pick yourself up, you dust yourself off and you keep going. Yeah. Because when people ask me, oh, what is the key to success as an entrepreneur? Because the next few companies worked well and I've been very fortunate the answer is one thing and one thing only for me, and that is perseverance. You keep pushing. Keep going. Right. Yes. That is, I've always told my kids, the secret of life, perseverance. You just 100%. keep going. You of course yes. correct when you figure out, hey, I've lost all my money and I'm moving back home. Light bulb, time to try something new. And then you, you move on and do the next thing. When I, before I started companies, I worked as a venture capitalist. And what I would say to entrepreneurs is, you know, I'd hold up their business plan and I'd say, the only thing I know for 100% certainty is it ain't going down like this. This plan is wrong. I don't know how it's wrong. I don't know how to fix it. All I can do as an investor is bet on your ability to persevere and adapt, mm -hmm. to listen to your customers, to listen to the market, to listen to your employees, to listen to your advisors, and constantly change and reshape and keep going at what is the highest probability path. Because this business plan, this ain't right. Is everything about it's wrong? I just don't know how. And neither do you. 
but I'm willing to put money in because I think you're smart enough and I think you're adaptable enough and I think you're going to stick to it and persevere. And that same would apply in the corporate world. If I'm hiring, I'm recruiting, I'm hiring somebody, you're not going to know all the skills that you need. You're not going to know the company. I'm betting on you to figure it out, Mm -hmm. move forward, adapt to the people and the atmosphere around you. Um, so those seem to be pretty analogous. It's, it's that stick to itiveness. I would completely agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Look, whatever the role is, if, whether it's at a startup or at a big company, you're given a broad set of goals and you need to figure out how to get, get to it. And most people are going to say, oh, well, you know, somebody else didn't do their part, so I couldn't do mine. Or there's this excuse or there's that excuse. And in big companies, you get to hide behind some things, yeah. <laughs> which means you can keep your job. But those that excel are the ones that say, I don't really care what other people want to think. I'm going to break down a wall and I'm going to get it done. And I'm going to be the person that is known as the person that gets things done. Yeah. And I will tell you, for me, early in my career, that was very, very important. Yeah. You know, to sit there and be the first one into the office and the last one to leave. There is a reason that you hear about successful people doing that. Yeah. Working I hard. Say, I say to my nieces and nephews, don't let anybody outwork you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I agree. It was, I mean, I always felt like I went through a rapid climb in the corporate world from being an assistant one day in a pretty prestigious entertainment company that immediately went through three acquisitions. Mm -hmm. And so it was like the world around me was shifting every five minutes. And I felt even as a young professional, it's like, raise my hand for stuff, raise my hand, be visible, sign up, volunteer. And in five years, I was the head of publicity, advertising and promotion for Sony's worldwide television group. Amazing. Not, I was not the smartest one. I was way not the most experienced one, but you know, I was on the front line every day, raising my hand, doing it. I will tell you this story, which I haven't told many people. So now I'm going to tell a lot of people. Oh, good. <laughs> so there is a wonderful man, or I should say was, because he's passed, named Jimmy Lee, who was once called the King of Wall Street. He ran the investment bank at uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. And he, for some reason, took a, took a shine to me. And he looked after me. Uh, when I was a junior investment banker. And I was always confused by it. I just didn't understand. Like, why is this guy who is on the cover of Forbes and, you know, the cover of the Wall Street Journal, why does he care? And one night, you know, he and I were like the only people in the office. It must have been one in the morning. And he looked at me and he said, you know, do you know why I've been looking after you? I'm like, no, I don't. I honestly (laughs) don't. He said, you know, when I was first starting, somebody told me, don't let anybody outwork you. They're always going to be smarter people. And he said to me, look, I was never the smartest guy in the room, but nobody outworked me. And what's so fascinating about you, Jeff, is you actually are the smartest guy in the room (laughs) and you still won't let anybody outwork you. And therefore, I will do everything I can to help you. And he did. And he was so incredibly kind and thoughtful. Uh, He unfortunately passed a few years ago. What a lovely story, though. That must have meant a lot. He's a great guy. They said I I cried. Oh, I'll bet. It's, it's nice to have those memories to hang on to and to remember the people that really did see something in you, maybe be, before you even saw it in yourself, yeah. that, that belief from someone else. So Jeff, are there any implications from what you've learned that apply particularly to women? Because I have a lot of women listeners. Is, is there anything different for women in this future world of work? So I was on the phone with a CHRO the other day. Uh, so she's a CHRO of one of the world's largest law firms. And she gave me her silver lining to COVID. Mm -hmm. Her silver lining to COVID was because of the rapid change that we had to do, where all of a sudden we're allowing remote work, we're allowing flexible work arrangements. She was elated because she felt that there were whole new talent pools. And she always points to that kind of prototypical MBA mom, right? The person that is incredibly highly educated, but took time off in order to have a family. Yeah. And that person's skills are being underutilized in the economy because that person might need a flexible work arrangement. And there were way too many firms that simply would not even consider it. Yeah. No, in order to be a part of this team, you have to be in this office nine to five, five days a week. That's what it means to be a part of this law firm. And this is one of the largest law firms in the world. Yeah. And because of COVID, as they started to understand, wow, this kind of works. Mm-hmm. And people are kind of, you know, able to be remote. And they then all of a sudden made a change. This was just a couple of weeks ago, 
where they will now engage people in a flexible work arrangement, people that can only work 30 hours a week or whatever. And I think that opens up a lot of opportunities um, for a lot of communities. And certainly women are one of them. When you look at the increase in the US labor force mm -hmm. over time, there is a very large increase going from the mid 50% of the labor force participation rate up to about 62 or 63%. And then during the dot-com boom, it hits to 67.3, which is its peak. Right now, we're sitting at about 60. The changes to the U.S. labor force, and one of the reasons that the United States has the most dynamic economy in the world is because we create more opportunities for women to engage in the labor force, not as many as we can and not as many as we should. Right. But we're actually very good at this as a society. It is something we have to get better, and we all know wage gaps and a host of other things. But right. There are, when you look at the story of economic growth in the United States, you can tell it through the lens of women entering the labor force in mass right. uh, in the late 1950s into the 1960s and then forward. And that is the, the story of American economic growth through this period of tremendous economic expansion in the United States. Well, I think then the, the strategy for women is to be the ones that speak up and say, I need a flexible schedule and here's what I can recommend and here's what I can do. And the smart employers are going to say, OK, let's do that. You are right. Look, as with my mantra on this book, we start with data. The yeah. data would tell us that pre-COVID, over the last 10 years, remote work grew from 1.5% of the labor force to 3% of the labor force. Yeah. And to the point you made, it was what we call a poll function. It was mostly the employee asking, in a lot of contexts, it might have been women asking because of a need for a flexible work arrangement, and mostly the employer saying no. Yeah. The employer saying, I think magic happens when people in the office. I think productivity equals presence. Point one, those antiquated mindsets, which drive me nuts. Yeah. And then second, companies didn't have the systems, the policies and the procedures to allow for flexible work. It's one thing to say, all right, cool. We think we should have flexible work. It's another to make sure every single meeting has a Zoom option. It's another to make sure that every system you have in the company is accessible outside of your four walls. And those are not insubstantial things. And a lot of companies simply resisted that. And so the 3%, the one and a half to 3% growth that we saw, if you had asked me pre-COVID, I would have said it's going to go to 3% to maybe 4%. And it wasn't going to grow that much more because we kind of picked all the low-hanging fruit. Now, because of COVID wiping away that antiquated mindset, making companies put in place the policies, procedures, and infrastructure, now that 3%, post-COVID, God willing soon, will be at about 8% of the U.S. workforce and about 32% of the U.S. workforce will be in a flexible work arrangement, meaning they won't be coming nine to five, five days a week. So right. that opens up a tremendous amount of opportunity, but it does in a lot of cases require people to raise their hand and to say, I need a flexible work arrangement because a year ago, uh, Libby, if somebody said to you, hey, I'm going to work from home next Friday, everyone would think, oh, that's cute. You know, Steve's really going to the beach or whatever. Now, if somebody says, hey, I'm going to work from home next Friday. You think, oh, great. I'll see you on the 10 a.m. Zoom. And then we have our project planning meeting on Slack at 4 p.m. I'll see you there. It is a very different mindset, which should benefit all people. Right. And I've had a remote team for a decade. So this is old news to me. I, I do think there's some truth in when you're together, the collaboration and the creativity maybe can flow more, mm -hmm. but productivity, you can do just fine working at home on your own. Without question, which is why 93% of remote workers live within a commuting distance of the office. Yeah. There is this fallacy that people think, oh, well, if it goes to remote work, then everyone just goes to India. Right. No, yeah. that is not what it means. It means mostly a flexible work arrangement. You do want to bring people together for those creative back and forths. Right, exactly. Without question. Exactly. So last question for you, Jeff. This being a laboratory about leadership, um, and I really am a, I'm a believer in experimenting. I'm on career, I guess, number three at this point. So experimentation and trying new things and taking risks and all of that has been it's just been part of my life for a long time. I was sort of thrown into the deep end at a young age and just kept, kept going. What, what idea, what action step, what could you ask listeners to employ? What, can, what experiment can we try at home to take some of your concepts and road test them? Well, the first thing I would say is to 
try a remote work construct or imagine a remote work construct and what that means post COVID. Because oh, a lot of the people that I've been having conversations with, CEOs of companies, CHROs of companies, they fall into the trap of thinking their productivity that they're seeing right now is what they're going to see in a post COVID world. It isn't because you won't have people being childcare providers or teachers. Yeah. You won't have people that have all kinds of external stresses on them. Right. And so what does your work look like? And are there things that you can do within your work environment to increase your productivity, but also to increase your wellness? Are you creating the routines that you need? And what are the three or four little changes? Do you want to put in your calendar at 12 p.m. every day a meditation for 10 minutes? Do you want to put in a little medita- a chime every 20 minutes so you look away from your screen so you don't yeah. burn out your eyeballs? I'll practice that right now. Yeah. Take like a There break. are a bunch of little hacks. I would challenge everybody to try three or four different hacks that right. allow them to be their better selves because that will lead to more productivity. That will lead to better happiness. And there are a bunch of things you can do. I mentioned that some of the things that I do and I try to look away from my screen every 20 minutes. And I try to meditate every day at 12. Does it happen? Do things sometimes come into my calendar and blow it up? Of course it happens. Yeah. Do I work out every single morning and, you know, the way I try to? No, it doesn't happen every day. Yeah. But I've actually calendared these things and those would work for me. And I'm sure that there are a lot of those hacks that will work for your people, but for your listeners, but they have to start experimenting and find what works for them. Not only what is productive, but what they can stick to. Yeah. And... Thank you. That's a good. That's a good test. As either an employee or a leader, do you um, do you have that vision in mind? Do you know exactly what your workplace should look like for you, for your team, uh, when uh, when this is all over and we go back to whatever's the next normal? And meantime, Jeff, where do we learn more about you, and where do we get your book and find out more about the work you're doing and all this amazing cool stuff that you're into? Well, LinkedIn is really the only social network that I'm that much of a part of. I have, I have Twitter. I mean, you can at Jeffrey Walls. They usually tweet angry things about uh, politics, but be that as it may. <laughs> um, no, I will always tweet things about uh, the world of work and, and yeah. cool articles I'm seeing and things like that. But LinkedIn is, is certainly That's the best the place. place. And then the book, you know, look, I was so fortunate to have the book come out in June. We hit number one in all of the Amazon HR categories. Awesome. For a hot minute, Amazon re-ranks you every hour. It's very yeah. painful to watch as <laughs> you kind of go up and down. Um, you just have to but, take that screenshot. That's the- Oh, I did. Yeah, of course. I 100, when I was an Amazon bestseller, I took Woo-hoo! screenshots yeah. all day, all day. <laughs> no question, <laughs> not even. Um, and so, you know, I would say that the book is also available wherever you can find, find books in all bookstores. But unfortunately, uh, bookstores are not yet fully open, at least here in New York City. And it looks like they won't be for some time. Um, But I will say one of the great joys of writing a book, and this was my second book, is walking into Barnes and Noble and seeing your book on the bookshelves. And it's just, it's such a wonderful feeling. It's such a humbling feeling. And then you take all the copies and you go up to the front counter and you put them down, you give them your credit card. And she just rings your credit card, doesn't look at all and doesn't care who the heck you are. She just says, thank you. And says next customer. And you're like, Oh, it's me. You didn't notice. Well, it used to be that you would say, I'll sign, may I sign the stock and you'd sign all your books and authors knew they wouldn't return them. If you had signed them, that no longer holds that your books are returnable. Even if you, as the author has signed them, they they can return them if they want. Well, I very much look forward to being at ADP's next conference because they have several thousand copies of the book that they have not sent out. So I will be signing them live at ADP's meeting of the minds and various other ADP. Oh, that's so great. That's so great. I think this is a, this is a topic that's, it's never going to go away and you can be updating this every single year, if not more often than that. So true. I know we can find you on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all those other places in the interim. And I really encourage everybody to do that because uh, there's a lot to learn. I'm not a data person, but I always default to data people because they are and I'm not. So that's, I think that's where you start and that's really important. So thank you so much for being here. This has really been a joy, really interesting. Thank Good luck in everything you're doing and that the end of jobs will next become the comeback of jobs as we, uh, as we move forward. Thank, Thank you, you so much.